I don't know why y'all are here. You already know how to praise. <laughs> I am going to talk about that kind of praise, but uh, not just yet. I wanted to start off by just telling you that y'all are so good. This is just the best congregation that there ever has been. <laughs> so special. <laughs> now in the decade that I was born, this country was dripping with yellow smiley faces and self-esteem movements. You can guess what decade, I don't care. It was the 70s. I will admit that some of it came across as corny and inauthentic to me even as a small child. I remember TV shows where actors addressed the camera directly, telling me how special I was. I found most of them to be quite ridiculous and would not tune in again. But one man was able to convince me. He was consistent, ritualistic, and believable. Every weekday at the exact same time, I would change whatever I was wearing to my favorite shirt with a zipper. I would set up my little pint-sized rocking chair in front of the television, place a pair of shoes nearby. This was my ritual for the start of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So God bless him. Won't you be my neighbor? I would sing along with the opening song, zipping up my little shirt at the same time that he zipped up his cardigan, putting my sneakers on as he changed into his and settle in. There was something about him, something authentic and convincing. And then as he would each and every day, he would tell me that I could make the day special just by being me. What, what, he told y'all too? Yeah. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I thought it was just me. Now this happened to be about the same time in my life that a close family friend of ours was uh, getting his PhD in psychology and he needed a child guinea pig for all of his IQ testing. So I remember taking tests several times over the course of the year and how excited that he was that I scored so high. He labeled me as gifted and set a course for me to follow that track in school. Now, I don't remember thinking much about that label again until middle school. Because see, in middle school, being gifted allowed me to get out of my regular classes if I finished my work. And I get to go to a special classroom where we did nothing but play video games, build rockets, and talk about different cultures. So I was stamped as one of the smart kids, and I remember feeling sad that my friends couldn't come with me to that room and play, essentially, especially when it was clear to me, and likely some of them, that they were in some ways a whole lot smarter than I was. And I remember thinking, even that early on, that I was getting away with something, that there had been some kind of mistake. I remember thinking how I'd better enjoy this while I can because likely I would be found out soon. You see, I have always been hyper aware of my own faults. I was one of those children who knew immediately when I had done something wrong in any realm from the simplest mistake to a really, really bad choice. My self-deprecation was similar. And the worst punishment for me was, of course, for any adult in my life to actually notice and pay attention to the fact that I had screwed up because I was so embarrassed, so devastated. And God forbid if they ever said, I am so disappointed in you. It was a direct stab to the heart. No further punishment really even needed. It was a wound that, to me, always felt on the verge of fatal. Something inside me, even that young, couldn't digest all the comments about inborn intelligence. I just didn't buy it. They didn't know how difficult I found math to be, for example. 
or how much I hated history because I couldn't remember dates, or just how hard I had to work in English. They didn't know the difference between what really came easy for me and those things to which I struggled to apply myself. There was a lot of conflict going on for me internally about the label, and they didn't have a clue. Now, I've been reading, and you know you're in trouble when I've been reading. I've been reading this new book called Nurture Shock, Thinking About Children, which has been written by authors Poe Bronson and Ashley Merriman. Nurture Shock. And in that book, research suggests that when we overpraise our children, or when we praise them ineffectively for being smart instead of praising them for putting forth their best effort or praising them for something specific. Research suggests that we set up our children to believe that they have no control over their success or their improvement. So the wrong kind of praise, or too much of it, lends to an inability to handle failure well. Now, I know that not everybody grew up in a household full of overpraise, <laughs> so maybe this sounds kind of ironic to you. But the lack of praise does just as much harm. And so overpraised children turn out to be less resilient than their peers, even in addressing what would be considered to be a normal failure in life. Now, I believe that this research has shed some light on why I had to work so hard as an adult to sort through what I labeled in seminary as my fraudulency complex. I was definitely not alone in my struggle. Many of my colleagues suffered the same irrational fear and even belittled their accomplishments. But the fraudulency complex, as I define it, was believing that at any moment, someone, likely someone official, whatever that means, would show up and recall all my successes. They would take everything back and deem me a fraud. My degrees and my certifications, my acceptance to seminary, you name it, I had simply fooled them all, all this time. Now, I used to think that this belief stemmed from some old God that I was still holding on to. You know the one I'm talking about, right? Now, there's only half of you, so I need you to talk twice as much. <laughs> you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. That God. Uh -huh. The one who will pull the rug out from underneath you the second that you are not on top of your game. You know that God? I used to believe that I had just allowed that Baptist preacher of my childhood way too deep into my psyche. But see, now with this new research, I kind of wonder how much of my struggle and my colleagues' struggle was not about the God we praised and instead was about how we were praised or not praised. Now, in this book, Nurture Shock, the authors suggest that those children who've been told that they are smart their entire lives, that they're special, end up dividing the world into two very distinctive categories, things that they are naturally good at and things that they are not. Constantly hearing you're smart, it turns out, does not translate into fearless confidence when attacking schoolwork or problems. Children who are overpraised actually do not want to try new things if they don't know for certain that they'll be successful. 